Welcome to Write for Joy. My name's Allie Cross. I'm a USA Today bestselling author and certified life coach. I have chased joy my whole life until one day I realized I already had it. I found my joy, and now my goal is to help you find yours. Joy is all around us, so let's see if we can grab some of it for ourselves today. I'm Allie Cross, and this is Write for Joy. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Write for Joy. Today, I'm joined by my friend and local author, David Belt. Now, I got to tell you, I knew that this guy was cool. But when I read his bio, I realized we are really talking to a real live Top Gun guy here. His bio reads a lot like that. Um, he has traveled all over the world, served in the U.S. Air Force, flying B-52s. He has been deployed to super secret places that he cannot tell anyone about. But it makes me wonder if we read all of his books, if that might be an indicator of where he's been. Write what you know and stuff. It makes me wonder if your books are ever set in some of those places. We won't tell the government, though, if you really are giving secrets in there. The part I didn't know was that he's a singer as well. And he sang for 15 years in the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square, which if you ever tune in to YouTube on Sunday mornings and listen to music and the spoken word, it's the choir that's featured there. They have traveled all over the world. I swear I'm going to give them time to speak, but his bio is just that amazing. He is a full-time software engineer. So busy guy with six kids. I am super glad he's a writer now because all of that experience has got to be shared. So David, a couple of questions for you. Where have you traveled with the choir? Uh, we have traveled um, extensively throughout the United States, Canada. I was on the Central European tour, which meant we went to Vienna, uh, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Germany. So between France. your childhood and your service as a missionary, you spent a lot of time in the Far East, and then you've traveled to Central Europe with the choir. And then, I don't know where you might have been deployed. I had flown a B-52, what they used to call Operation Chrome Dome. It's basically where the B-52 is flying in a circle and constantly refueling just off the Siberian coast in the Gulf okay. of Okay, yeah, so during the Cold War with Russia. So you have yet to travel the southern continents, like South America? Me we went to Mexico this year um we're going to the bahamas this year my, my wife and i have been all over the uk norway denmark so you could all mediterranean greece i'll give you world traveler but you need to go see Africa and Australia so that you can truly say you are a world traveler because you're so we close. Want to, we want to go to South America. It will happen next year. Next year, we're going to Spain and Portugal and the UK again. But we would like to go to South America. We're trying to work that out. We're trying to work out Australia, New Zealand. If I don't go to New Zealand and I don't see Hobbiton, I'm going to be very upset. Well, I wish you the very best with your travels. In this giant information that I shared about you, we didn't get to talk about your books. So can you tell us real quick 
a little bit about your books, what you write. I have one science fiction novel. It's a fairly dark novel set in a prison on one of the moons, Jupiter. The idea for that one actually came to me when I was in high school, when I was studying King Lear. And so there are a lot of King Lear tied into it. I have one nonfiction book, which wouldn't surprise you to realize is on armor. Oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't I even touch the fact that you are weapons obsessed. For those of you listening who are not not seeing that he is surrounded by gorgeous weaponry and armor. No, Dave often teaches classes in the writing conference circuits on weaponry and such so that people can write about it. Accurately. And the rest of my work is a genre that I call Latter-day Saint horror, um, which uh, is a misleading thing. There are scary bits, but the horror isn't the point. They all involve a Latter-day Saint protagonist. They're all set in the real world with a supernatural element introduced. And they're deeply faith-based about people who are trying to be decent Latter-day Saints and cling to their covenants when through really dark times. Some people compare that to real life. Wayne just happened to have vampires in it or sure. the ability to telepathically communicate with ravens or something right? like that. It's only a matter of time before we start seeing weird and crazy supernatural things. So I'm, I'm with you. I think it's so interesting. For those of you who don't know, Latter-day Saint is a member of the religion, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It would appeal to Christians of all denominations. Oh, oh definitely. If you think Latter-day Saint imagery. So Most vampire books, for example, have use a Hollywoodized Catholic imagery. I'm going a different direction, tapping into Hebrew myth folklore. Awesome. So if you're looking for Christian-based horror and science fiction and urban fantasy, that's what he's talking about when he calls it Latter-day Saint horror. And as a urban fantasy writer myself, I really admire David for doing this because it allows him to stay true to his principles as he's writing. And it eliminates a lot of that kind of should I or shouldn't I in terms of what to include or whatever. There are a lot of Christians out there who would love to read Supernatural and Horror, but would like to see it in a context that makes more sense to them. And I'm sure the Catholics out there will be very happy to hear that you're not picking on their religion as every other <laughs> Supernatural story does. So we're here to talk about joy. Before we get started, can you tell us what joy means to you? Joy is uh, everything, everything in my life is centered around the idea that I hope to be with my wife and my family for eternity. I believe that a good story has to have romance in it, but I have a tendency to write romances that go beyond the altar, meaning that I have a book coming out, hopefully next month, that is about a couple that's been married and has a five-month-old baby and they're in school and they're starving and all of that. And it's very much about their passionate romance and all the forces that can attack that and tear it apart. It's about them. I wrote the first novel in that series where you just barely meet the man that the protagonist is going to marry. And you assume they're going to marry, but they literally shake hands and that's it. <laughs> and then the next book is they're married. They've got a five-month-old baby. 
And when I lost over, oh, the horror, all the courtship and everything, I, I wasn't interested in telling that part of the story. The one thing I want to point out is that I find joy in lifting people. If I tell a story where you come away and you feel better, you've gone through hell to get there, but you feel better at the end than I did my job. So I find joy in sharing, in building, in uplifting, and in everything I can do to make my family eternal. Okay, so so you define joy an eternal principle and relates to your family, right? And then yeah. you talked a little bit about your goal to uplift others. Is that is that where you find joy? How do you write something that end goal is to uplift someone else? Sure. I put joy in the process because, I, okay, a little, maybe more detail than you want. I don't plot. I have never been able to do that. I will sit down and write down a list of things that might happen in the book, but I don't even know necessarily how the book is going to end when I get to the end. That sounds very well, scary well, to me. Not that I'm plotting. I'm okay with you not plotting, but. I always like to know where I'm going. <laughs> so you're okay with flying blind. You did it in real life. So why shouldn't you do it in your stories? You're flying blind and you have faith that you'll write what needs to be written, right? Where I find joy in the writing is that before I start a story, I do very detailed character sketches. I write out who these people are what motivates them? What are their fears? What are their joys? I write down the kinds of things that they might say. And that includes the villains. I got to really understand the villain and what pushes them to do what they have done or what they continue to do. I don't like writing the Joker. The Joker just does things because they're evil. If I write a sociopath, I want to know why the sociopath is the way they are. And telling me they were born that way doesn't work for me. And so I write the sketches, and then I've got a basic idea of how to set everything up. But then I'll dive in, and I'll build the scenario, and I let the characters do what they're going. And I remember in my first novel, my... 270 year old female protagonist gets asked a question. I knew exactly how she was going to answer it. I knew exactly what was going to happen in that chapter. And I got to the question and got to her answer. And she spoke up in my head and said, I would never see such a thing, Lottie. This is what I do. And she did something completely different. And it changed the course of the novel. And it made things better because I had no idea this was coming. That's so cool. Talk about writing a character first story, like a character based story. Your characters are literally living the story as you put it on the page. That's got to be exciting and exhilarating. It's like reading a novel. It's just that it's coming out of your fingertips. So how fun. Now, when I first started, I was going to write a, a book about the idea being that vampirism is a deliberate choice. There's no animal blood cop out. You have to live on human blood. I was going to write about the world's first and only unwilling vampire. Problem was I couldn't get there. I couldn't figure out in my head how... You have an unwilling vampire when it must be a deliberate choice. It's me literally 10 years. But suddenly it occurred to me, I have to make this guy a Latter-day Saint. I have to make him part of my faith. And all the things that would entail. And once I did that, then I sat down and wrote all the rules of vampirism out. You know, 
what I'm going to incorporate from mythology, what I'm going to not use, how do things work scientifically? How do they fly? How do they heal? Where does that energy come from? I actually won't tell you today, it's 697 I have a point something or other. I actually know how many calories are in a, a pint of blood. <laughs> uh, and if you're saying they're not going around killing multiple people a night, how do they possibly survive? Where does that energy come from? I had to figure all that stuff out. But once I got I those it. tools down, I decided I was going to write. Not first book is told from a man's point of view. He's the unwilling vampire. But I wanted to write a story about the woman who mentors him. And so I just wrote a short story. And it was a Christmas story. <laughs> and it was about this woman who has no hope because she chose to be a, a murderer. She chose to kill people for reasons you might sympathize with, but she's been spending two and a half centuries trying to figure out how to get redemption and she, and she has no hope. And it was all about, I was trying to explore that. And then I got to know her. I got to know what motivated her in this story. And that was just a trial balloon to see how this would work. And I set that aside. This is something that happened during the past, and I'll relate it in, in, in the broad strokes somewhere along the line. And then I wrote the book about these two, and I kept coming back to that story. And uh, I've got a small anthology in the works, filling in some of these backstories on people. And that one is going to go in. But yes. It's a Christmas story. It's a dark Christmas story that ends on a huge note of hope. Can we get that story? Can we buy that story or do we sign up for you your newsletter get for, to get? You can get it for free on my website. It's under unwillingchild.com. There is a free stuff link on the homepage. And under there's Wora Trips. Awesome. Very so I'll definitely show. put those links in the show notes. Because I want to read that story. So uh, since the anthology is not out yet, I'm going to go get it from your website. David, this has been such an interesting conversation and inspiring to me personally, because I'm a pantser as well. I sometimes like to put up signposts, but I don't do a lot of detail. But I have been feeling personally that something in my process needs tweak. And it's the character sketches. I know my characters before I go in, but I haven't committed them to anything. I haven't written anything about them. And I think that might be the missing link for me personally. So thank you for sharing that along with your feelings on joy. I think that it's good for all of us writers to know that there are ways to find joy even in the process and to write with purpose, even if you might never talk to a reader who's had a positive experience with your book. You have put your heart and soul into it and put it out there and it will do its job. I think that it's encouraging and hopeful for us to know that it's okay for us to feel that way. And there always is hope, right? If there was not hope, I don't think there would be joy. So thank you for sharing that. Do you have any last words you'd like to share with the audience before we sign off? Sure. A couple of things. First of all, uh, if you're going to write your own stories, don't worry about what's popular. Don't worry about the, what the market is demanding. By the time you get done, by the time you get published, the market will have changed. I wrote the Children of Lilith trilogy in the height of the Twilight craze. And I was told, vampires are done. We don't need any more vampires. Vampires uh, never die. <laughs> My approach was very different. But if I'd have done that, if I'd have tried to write what I was being told I had to write, it wouldn't have yeah. been honest. 
The second thing is that so much of what I write is actually autobiographical or extrapolations on things that have happened to me or members of my family or people I know. The last novel I finished, which is under contract, will come out. Not sure if it'll be the end of this year or next year, but it was actually a B-52 novel. And I had to wait a very long time before I could write it because so many things are classified, <laughs> to be honest. And I avoided the details like airspeeds and so on that would that would put people in danger. But I, um, I mean, it's a Latter-day Saint horror novel, so we're talking, it's in the Witch of White Lady Hollow series, but it's about the hijacking in 1987, uh, a fictional hijacking of 1987 of a B-52 fully loaded with nukes. It was actually a scenario that was very possible in 1987. It's not possible now. But that's why one reason why I had to wait to write this story, because it can't happen now. It could have happened then. But the joys of life, the pains of life, the things that have really driven me, the joy of singing, the weapons really have fall into the idea that we're, that I want to be, I want to talk about things that mean something to me, but in a way that, that makes historical sense. You see the Roman armor behind me. I wrote a first century Roman, a, a novel about a first century Roman officer in Roman Britannia, 61 AD. And I studied that army life. And of course, he's a Christian, one of the few in the Roman army. I studied Roman life and army life and the tactics and the technologies that they used. and how this Roman shoe allowed 10,000 Romans to stand against 230,000 Celts in a battle you've probably never heard of. But it, it's really fascinating because although I write fantasy, the facts, the history that go into it are actually more impressive than anything I could make up. <laughs> That's really cool. You're a really neat guy and so full of so much information. We could probably do like a whole afternoon just about, and maybe even then would just be scratching the surface. But thank you for sharing what you did, because I think that it's helpful and interesting to us. Thanks so much for being a guest today, David. Thank you. Once again, everyone, check out the show notes to go and find David and his books. You got to go read that Christmas story, if nothing else, right? And in the meantime, I hope that you will go out and grab your joy and find out what it is that lights you on fire and keeps you going. Because once you do, so many other things become manageable. Amen. <laughs> I appreciate all of you listening and we'll see you again next week. Thanks again, David. And bye everyone. Bye. Uh